Welcome to Every Church of Peace Church. Uh, you are used to seeing uh, Attorney Donald Edwards sitting here, but I'm hosting today and really having a dialogue with one of the most exciting people that deals with this subject of peace quite fully, and that is Reverend Emmanuel Charles McCarthy. And we're very thankful to have a Catholic priest with us on this, as well as most of the Protestants we've had, to show that this is broad and that everyone who deals seriously with the Christ, who deals seriously with the Christian Church, regardless of the name on the front door, uh, must understand that the need to follow Christ nonviolently is as deep as the faith itself. And uh, uh, I like a, a book uh, by Father McCarthy that is so important. Uh, All things flee thee, for thou fleest me is the title. But let's get past the fleest, all right? and the old language and understand that this man speaks to the day. He says, a cry to the churches and their leaders to stop running from the nonviolent Jesus and his nonviolent ways. Uh, I am C.T. Vivian. I've been on the program before, and I'm very thankful to be here with Emmanuel Charles McCarthy as, we, as I really sort of badger him into giving you more and more of this great knowledge that he has. Has. Uh, uh, Father McCarthy, is that uh, uh, when we begin to think of the nonviolent Jesus and his nonviolent ways, uh, it's not only the matter of ourselves as individuals, is it? It's a matter of how we make this culture a nonviolent culture, isn't it? Not? Well, of course, CT. I mean, as human beings, just as human beings, we are not isolated atoms. We're gregarious. We live in society. We have to live in society. We're not independent. We're interdependent. Every one of us is made by thousands and probably tens of thousands of other people. We can't live alone. Huh? And therefore, if we're going to have, if, if, if the gospel is going to mean anything, it has to have a communal or societal or cultural yeah. uh, dimension to it. Yes. Yeah, in sure. fact, uh, in fact, we can never really know who we are separate from the culture in which we live, can we? And we can never really know our potential for spiritual life in particular separate from, can we? Absolutely not, because the culture gives us our language. Mm -hmm. It gives us our models to imitate. Before we even know that, that we're making ourselves by decisions, we're already made by all kinds of things mm -hmm. in the culture. Huh? Yeah. And, uh, uh, and this word culture becomes so tremendously important to us as we struggle with, as individual Christians, as we struggle with, as, 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 as churches, and as we struggle with as denominations, as we struggle with simply as bodies of Christ. This whole struggle that we have between, uh, around this culture that pulls us one way and this Christ that pulls us another. Uh, 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 and when we think about peace, I know that uh, from reading parts of your book here, uh, that just has, it, it strikes me that that's a central concern of yours. Of course, people, People crave peace. People want to live in peace. They want peace in families, peace in neighborhoods, peace in their world, peace on their job. Peace is what we're made for. Ah. But if there is to be peace, yes. it just can't be internal tranquility. <laughs> there has to be peace among people, not just peace within people. And so the, the problem is, cultures are human creations. Yeah. We can create a way of human organization that promotes peace, that makes peace easier, that makes peace almost inevitable, or we can create ways of organizing human life that, that is simply outwardly ordered, but, but inwardly just torn apart by violence and unpeace and hate and enmity and all those things. But it's up to us to create one or the other. In fact, um, uh, working with uh, Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, Martin used to say that uh, 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 in many ways that uh, peace is not a thing in and of itself, that without peace, without justice, without love, 
without truth, without a concern for each other, we can never have peace anyway. And I think that's so important as we consider that we're now in a time of war. That's one of the reasons that we could come forth with every Church of Peace Church so in such a startling and meaningful way. And yet, uh, uh, if we're allowing people to starve across the world, uh, if, in fact, we have such injustices among us against uh, races, against uh, genders, uh, uh, against people generally, uh, there can never be any peace anyway, can there? That, but my point is, is that I think a great number of us think that if we can start and stop a war, that peace ended when we started a war and peace starts again when we end a war. Uh, 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 I don't think you really believe that in totality, do you? No, I don't think anyone really does because we know that the human being that goes out and, and sheds blood and kills in war and put in all the terrible situations in war, when the big shots who started the war, the old men that started the you. war, when they signed the peace treaties, the young men that go back to 40 or 50 years of life, go back to 40 or 50 years with memories that no human being should have to carry around with them. And, uh, and so peace is not about the absence of, of war. That's uh, sure there's absence of war if there's peace. But it's infinitely more than that. It's, a, uh, it's, it's about our relationship with God. It's about our relationship with each other. Yeah. It's about what goes on inside in our own minds. The person who, say, is offended by a piece of gossip and keeps going on in his own mind like a broken record. Yeah. He offended me. He offend yeah. There's no peace. Yeah, there's no peace. Okay. And that's it. In fact, Martin uh, used, um, uh, you had the first half of a line that uh, I was thinking about Martin. Martin says that, uh, that peace is not the absence of things, it's the presence of things. Uh, and without those presence, of, without the presence of things, there can never be peace. And, uh, uh, and it seems as though that one of our problems is, I was thinking about a line from Amos, when he says, they don't know how to do right. Mm. Uh, uh, 310, where he says, they, they, they garner uh, violence and and, uh, uh, and wealth into their strongholds. Uh, they don't know how to do right, because all they can think about is violence. All they can think about is the use of violence in order to fit their own greed. And, uh, and, uh, I, and as I read Amos thinking about it, Amos was not talking about an individual. He was talking about the nation of Israel. Right. And, and, uh, uh, and I think as we, as we approach these things, we have to think about the nation of America, uh, the, the, the nation in which we're a part, or the culture in which we're a part, and, uh, and who is control of it, as you say, the old men upstairs, huh? mm -hmm. uh, who are concerned about self and that inside ego that is in war with God, right? Uh, is that, um, and, and I'm, I always have the feeling, Father, that if we could make those kinds of things clear to the masses of people, whether in a building called a church or religious structure or outside in the street, if we could make that plain, people would not act in the same way. It would be far more difficult to talk them into a war or get them to act as though their nation was the only nation in the world and those near them were the ones that were supposed to live but anyone else can die and we don't think about it. Uh, uh, but how would we do that, Father? Well, you know, one of the things that we as Christians are confronted with, of course, is Jesus' own prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Yes. Our Father. Father. Our. Our. Hour. Always an hour in there. Right. Now, I remember a chaplain in the Second World War telling me in the South Pacific that when the, when the folks, the British and American folks that he served, when they said Our Father together, they no more thought of the Japanese than the man in the moon. That's exactly right. Gone. That's right. And that's how the churches, as they have become more and more nationalistic, as they have literally sold out to the economic and political elite of society after society, they have kind of nurtured from the cradle that our father means our American father, father. our French father, father. our Ch Russian right. father. Mm -hmm. This, and, and I, I don't want to press the word, but I mean it, 
This is heresy. That's right. Because this is not what Jesus taught. There we go. Our Father is the unifying reality of all human life, and our Father is the one who gives us this world for us. It is when someone goes out of their way to take what is common for all and confiscate it to themselves, yeah. he can't be functioning under a Christian ethos of our Father. Hence, C.T., I think one of the great conversations about violence and about peace is the conversation between violence and poverty. Uh -huh. Keep going. 350 years ago, Aristotle said poverty was the cause of crime and rebellion. That's 350 years yeah, before Jesus. I before Jesus, all right? Now, what we have, what we have today in most of the Christian churches in the world, uh, my church, most churches, right down to house churches, we have an active operating sense that the right to private property mm -hmm. is superior mm -hmm. to the needs of the weak. That's it. It is not superior. And in the was, gospel, yeah. the needs of the weak is superior to the right of it's private property. Precisely, and it's all the way through from the beginning of the Old Testament right through the New Testament. Absolutely. Is that there's no point that it's not true. Here is that, you see, if we, if we right now, when we begin to think of the fact that uh, those that talk about our father and think only of themselves, uh, find that they think that nobody that they don't think of as, as our father huh, is uh, worthy. So we allow them to be poor. We allow them not to have food. We allow them to be outside of some things that we have learned that could help them. Hmm? And even when we give, give, when we are willing to share with them, it's a matter of taking what they've got like colonialism, right? Except we just do it in a different form. That's right. Uh, That's right. Uh, but it's still, when you get down to it, we enrich ourselves by helping, quote unquote, them, right? And when we look at this kind of thing, we have to ask ourselves: At what point is does God Himself intervene into society? Uh, in such ways, because you say the Old Testament and the New Testament, from one begins to end, makes the poor the important thing, right? We know, yeah, we exactly. know that God intervenes. Yes, we know that He intervenes when mercy and justice yes. become lost in a yes. society. Yeah. He intervenes because, like uh, the author of Ecclesiastes, uh, Jesus Ben Sera, said about 180 years, I think, before Jesus. The bread of the needy, the bread of the needy, needy is the life of the poor. Yeah. The one, the one who deprives the needy of their bread is a man of blood. Yes. Now, in this world, one person dies every nine seconds, seconds. from starvation. That's, that's, that's exactly right. And four pounds of food is produced every day per person. Yeah. There's no need for this. There's no need for it. There are men of blood out there who are functioning as honorable, just, good, holy, pious Christians, and they are literally depriving the needy of what they need, not to live in luxury, That's right. but just to live. Just to live. In fact, uh, uh, our daily bread is a serious matter, it seems like, for, uh, for Christians, is that we should be concerned not about how much we can store up in barns, all right? Uh, uh, but uh, to use, and I say that in terms of, of our language of the faith, right? Uh, but in fact, how many people do not have to die, do not have to live with bloated bellies, who do not have to have their minds uh, 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 short-circuited because of a lack of food and energy that would feed them so that they have a hard time, if ever, becoming the people they were supposed to be. Is that, is that it, when we really think about it, and you were quoting someone, you know, a couple of thousand years before, or a few, before few Jesus, hundred yeah. years before Jesus, I couldn't help but think of uh, of an Eisenhower, right? Who, who, uh, and there's two things that stands up to me about this line. One of them is never used, but is the fact that every bullet, hmm, every bomb, Every weapon of war, in other words, that we create and we use, hmm, robs the poor. 
That's right? right. And he and he went out of his way to talk about robs the poor, right? Robs those that are without. It doesn't rob the rich. Not it enriches all. them, right? That's all right. right. Now, but it it robs the rest. And it, you know, it's, it, now, uh, and he says, and humanity. Then he says is on a cross of steel because of our uh, uh, our going to war, continuing to war, warring when it, uh, 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 under any and all circumstances, almost to create it. Huh? Like we jump so quickly at, at this war, right? Went past everything that would say that we shouldn't be in it in order to have it, which uh, would make anybody suspicious, not only suspicious, but realize that we were going back a couple thousand years. The other thing that, that, that stands out for me in Eisenhower's statement is Eisenhower didn't make that statement until the end of his presidency. Very end. Yeah, very end. <laughs> very end. Is it, uh, it was in that final message, right? Yeah. Now, uh, uh, is that how long does it take before uh, those who know to speak out, whether they are uh, whether they are janitor or president, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is right. it how long does it take all of us to speak out, whether they're preacher or president? How long does it take us all to stand out huh? right. and stand up and say, in the name of the poor, in the name of our God, in the name of just plain decency, all right? that we refuse to let people die in this matter when we know that we could restructure ourselves and our sense of values to create a life worthy of our humanity. Is that, uh, 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 but if he could stand up at the end, it seems like somebody's got to stand up at the beginning. Hmm? Well, you know, today, today, CT, uh, exploitation, unlike, say, in feudal times when it was done by direct raw power. You yeah. Know? Today, exploitation is done legally. Oh, yes. Ah, yeah, it's done legally. But what's interesting is that this is nothing new to do exploitation ah, legally. That's exactly right. Way that's back, what I was in, going way to back say. in the Old Testament. Yes, that's right. That's Isaiah. Right. That's right. Listen to this from yeah. Isaiah. Uh, okay. Isaiah says, Woe to you legislators of infamous laws. Yes. To those who issue tyrannical decrees. Oh, boy. Who refuse justice to the needy. That's who it. cheat the poor That's among it. the people of their right. That's exactly right. There's, this is, to you know, there's, a, there's an interesting kind of thing, isn't there? And that is, it, it goes something like this. Um, does, does wealth, does wealth that is immorally gotten become moral just because it's passed on to my children? In fact, or grandchildren. <laughs> huh? In fact, in fact, uh, what we find anyway is that because it's passed on, does not mean that it changes the route it takes, changes serving the same ends that it was serving, because it was passed on. See, and I think this is our problem with our personalism, right? Oh, pardon me, not in terms of God, but in terms of our seeing ourselves, our individualism mm -hmm. is what mm -hmm. I should have said. That we 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 tie it to an individual rather than to the institutional flow mm -hmm. that uses that wealth. All right, is that uh, uh, if you uh, uh, now you may leave X millions to your children, each one of them. Right? But if they got the same consciousness you've got, it does not make any difference. If they allow those millions to be used by the same banking interest, financial interest, uh, that are uh, trying to maximize every penny, uh, uh, whether it uh, hurts people or not, it hasn't changed. It is still a part of the same institution. It's still a part of the same thing. Uh, uh, it, it, it bothers me when I when I hear uh, people say, well, you see, I uh, don't, uh, don't count me uh, as one of those. I didn't own slaves, but you live off of it. Hmm? Uh, uh, don't, don't, I never beat anybody on the back, but because your grandfather did, you are still receiving uh, uh, the benefits of it without saying anything, without admitting it, now, without dealing with what it. What you're saying, yeah. what you're saying, St. John Chrysostom, one of the great saints, yeah, 364, great saints. Six, right. 364. Keep going. Yeah, he's one of the great. This is what he writes. He says, tell me, 
How is it that you are rich? From where did your riches come? <laughs> From whom did you receive your wealth? Talk. Your father? Yeah. Your mother? Your uncle? And he, who did he receive it from? Come. From his grandfather, you say. By climbing the genealogical tree, you are able to show that your wealth is moral? <clears throat> you know better. <laughs> yeah, you know better. You know better. Rather, its beginning and its roots have necessarily come out of violence and injustice. That's it. And now this is what we got to ask. We're getting a bigger and bigger discrepancy between rich and poor. poor. Where there is a victim, yep. there's a victimizer. Yep. And where there's a victimizer and a victim, there are people that profit from victimization. Precisely. I have no problem with the children of the rich receiving a good education. Me neither. But what I want to know is, what about the children of those who are victimized? That's right. What about the children of those who produce that wealth? We don't talk about that. We don't talk about it. Yeah. Right? Is, is that, uh, uh, and yet, God has so made the world and our relationships that we still have to deal with it, right? Is that uh, 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 we, uh, we still, it's on our mind, on our conscience. It still keeps us from being the beings we could be. Uh, and, and we don't preach that, right? Even in the house of God, we don't, we don't preach it, see? Is that we don't even bring up the issues. We, in fact, beg for the dollars, right? And we don't ask where they come from. We don't care how they were used. We have no, uh, we, we don't think about the blood on them. I, and, and, and more and more what bothers me is that public education never deals. Isn't it interesting that, that we haven't any courses in our curriculum, and you can go all the way through college, uh, unless you happen to be in one of the one of the particular disciplines, and you have no courses on capitalism, you have no courses on racism, you have no courses that really tell us the relationships, then and the activities that created our culture, all right, uh, so that. How then can we ever correct ourselves or redeem the actions of our past right? mm -hmm. or allow then for a full fellowship and brotherhood? And the prophets put it so right. In fact, you know what? Uh, when you read that, what I couldn't help but think about is something uh, that, uh, that every politician uses. And it's said very simply, uh, the prophet, of course, and the way uh, 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 means it means goes beyond what the politician is saying. But the politician says, follow the dollar, right? You follow the dollar and you get at what's really happening, right? Mm -hmm. You can really get what's going on, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and the prophets were sociologists in that great sense, you know, is it because they were always saying, uh, what is the root of? Where did you get it? Where did it come from? What are you about as yep. a result of it, as a result of it? And and this is what I think that we have to see as we create, as we try to create globalization, right? is that is what we're doing now so that we can sit on top of it is the vast army and the, and, the, and the instruments of war that we are creating hmm? and the use of our wealth uh, that sidesteps uh, uh, the poor, that creates war. When I, have more than, when I have more than I need yep. and another person doesn't have enough to live, yeah. the only way that I can keep that person from taking the excess that I have is not by appeals to reason, because it's not reasonable, not by appeals to Jesus, because he wouldn't tolerate it. Uh, right. I've got to have the gun. Uh, I've got to have violence. So if you want to be the most luxurious society in the world, then you have to have the biggest military in the world to protect it. And if you want to keep expanding that across continents and countries and cultures, where you have ordinary people being forced into jobs that are basically subsistence labor. Uh, huh? Right. You've got to have the means of keeping the gun at their head. And without that, without that, then you would not have the level of luxury that we're talking about. Most often, the use of violence is to rob. Most often, the use of violence is to, in fact, steal, to gain power. Uh, uh, 
to be used in the process of taking. Uh, it seems that every citizen must examine themselves in regard to their nation's use of violence. Uh, most often, the nation has excuses for it. The administrations in power, whether it be this one or another, uh, has excuses for it. But every citizen must ask themselves, does, does it make sense? Uh, it seems like they have to ask themselves, is which is most important to me at this hour, that I back those that are in authority on earth, or do I back those that are in authority in my heaven, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, they have to ask themselves about their personal sense of integrity, not their personal sense of nationalism. Uh, and when I hear you quote the prophets as you, mm -hmm. as you quote them, and I think of Israel, right? Is it, it and uh, what happened to them because they didn't obey the prophets, right, at various times? Uh, then I have to think about uh, what could happen to the nation. Uh, and that brings me uh, to, it seems like we all have to think very seriously about what do I personally do? What do I call on my nation to do? Hmm? What do I call on my church to do? All right. Is that, and it brings me to that if every church really saw itself as a church that opted for peace, that would be well on our road toward that. But I know that there are other things. What would you suggest as another thing? Well, focusing on the church, C.T., I think that we're <clears throat> confronted very seriously with a problem of grave ignorance, not only among congregations, but among preachers, among bishops, among priests, among ministers. And that is... People do not know the history of the working poor in the world. Oh, that's great. That's great. Now, Without that, yeah. you, you, you think it's like the myth out there, that everyone is in all, you know, working their way up. I, this I is said, nonsense. Ah. See, without that history, you don't have the material you know, to but, educate with. In fact, that's another thing that stands out. We've had no courses in poor people's movements. We Never. have had no Never. courses in the social movements. We act as though it happened politically. Next week, we'll take, we'll start with that. Wonderful. All right? Wonderful. All right, because we are going to be together next week. We are. Right. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Uh, every Church of Peace Church, look forward to the coming week as we prepare to dialogue and talk together with a man who knows, who says that, what we're about is a cry to the churches and to their leaders to stop running from the nonviolent Jesus and his nonviolent ways. How long will it take to